So, um, I, I always like to start by making clear that we aren't necessarily talking about your children. We could be talking about your grandchildren. We could be talking about nieces and nephews. We could be talking about neighbor kids. It could be any children you care about. Um, and I believe that most people, especially the people who care enough to come to a workshop like this, already know a lot about what they need to do and they or what they what they want to convey at least and the place to start is with the worksheet I gave you which I didn't keep a copy of but it has questions about what do you what what are your beliefs what do you what beliefs do you think are important what what are you, and I think the, I think it has questions about strengths and and and, and weaknesses even your own um, thank you ma'am um, your own yeah, strengths and weaknesses. And, and why? That last question, why? It's really, it's really helpful to start by looking inside yourself and thinking about what it is you want your, the kids you care about to, to know and learn about money. And um, if we had a group, <laughs> we would perhaps talk about some of those things. Um, I don't know if you have any off the cuff responses and that poor Betsy's on the phone now. So, but Julie or Tim, any thoughts about what you'd want your kids to um, know about? Well, just the value of money. Um, value, how to save money, why it's not always good to spend money on a bunch of little things when you might want to save it for a bigger thing. Mm -hmm. um, the frivolous a dollar, $2 here, what mm -hmm. up to 10, 20, 30 dollars. The potential, day. yep. Yep, the potential value of all of that. Th and th those are, first of all, those are common responses. A lot of people feel that way. And, and they're, they're valuable responses. Those are some of the things that I like to teach people too when I, when I have them as adults. So those are great things. And you may, you may think about more things too. I also, it's not an accident that this I made this sheet. I mean, it's not an accident that it has the questions about what are you good at and what are your weaknesses? Because I think sometimes people feel like they can't convey things to their kids because they're not good enough themselves. Um, and I, it's really valuable and you have to think about situationally and in, in, in the context of your relationship with your kids, but it's really valuable to say to a child or, or to make clear to a child that, you know, I'm not perfect at this either and I wish I was better at it and here's why and here's what, what I need to work on doing and I would encourage you to work on doing that too. It's, it's really important to not feel like you have to be a perfect role model. We'll talk about role modeling too, but um, being aware of what your strengths and weaknesses are is important too as you come into this. Sometimes parents have this idea that they teach from above and they, you know, every that I'm always right, and none of us are. <laughs> none of us is always right, and so if we're kind of straight with ourselves about that up front, then we can approach the conversations and and uh, lessons and whatever with our kids from an honest point of view and then we won't have our kids coming back at us and saying you're a hypocrite. <laughs> so being aware of your strengths and weaknesses is also valuable and and giving thought to the why, why some of these things are important. Um, and this is an ongoing, this would be, an, if you kept this worksheet out, this would be an evolving piece. It wouldn't be something that you do it today and it's done for life. Whatever people say when they fill out this sheet, then it's, it's useful to, to kind of take a step back and think about these five categories. Because usually, virtually everything that we might want our kids to know about money fits into one of these categories. You talked about things, Julie, that mentioned um, spending and saving that fit in those two categories. And those are skills kids need to learn and that they do learn one way or another. They learn how to spend and they, they 
gain attitudes and ideas about spending. They gain attitudes and ideas about saving. Whether or not we actually teach them to save, they still get some ideas about whether it's important or isn't important. Uh, sharing is another core underlying piece of using money. Um, how do we share money? And sometimes that's giving gifts to people. Sometimes it's charitable. Um, things. Sometimes it's um, through investing even, in investing in projects that are going to do good. Um, but sharing is for most people a piece of what kids want to learn about money. Um, earning, how to earn money and that earning money is valuable, and then borrowing. So those five categories also sometimes cause people to take this worksheet and say, oh yeah, I didn't think of this. I gotta put this down because this is something that's real important to me for my kids to learn. So that's just another um, background piece. We start, and you used this word, um, we start with values. Our, our values and our goals affect how we use money. We don't always know that. We don't always think about it, but it's always true. However we use money, is a reflection of what's important to us or what we think is important to us. Our values are basically our beliefs and practices. You know, they are whatever's important to us. And they're usually pretty deep underlying, um, deep-seated things. Things, beliefs about what's good, what's desirable. These are things that are, are valuable. That's where the word valuable comes from. Our values come from our experiences. I mean, if, if we've had experiences of being hungry in our lives, then we value security, knowing that there's food in the cupboard, um, various kinds of experiences. Being shared with, having other people share with us, causes us to recognize the value of sharing when it's our turn that we can share with others, or at least it can in many cases. But our values are personal and unique. Your values are not going to be exactly the same as my values and not exactly the same as the next person's values. Um, we have a lot of values that we share as a society. There are certain values that are ingrained into law in our society, things like honesty and, and so on. Um, but there's going to be nuances. No two people are going to have the exact same values. And we have to stop and recognize that because sometimes our kids may end up with, well not may, they will end up with values that are a little different than ours. They could end up with values that are dramatically different than ours, depending, but no matter what, they'll at least be slightly different than ours. And, and we have to have some respect for that, that they have a reason for valuing some, a certain aspect of things more highly than we do. Um, but we also can influence what their values are by what we teach them and what we show them. Then based on or after values, we come to goals. And, and goals are more specific. Goals are, are like targets. <laughs> They're a specific objective we want to accomplish. And um, our goals always come from our values. If we set a goal, we may not have thought about it, but if my goal is to put my kids through college, then that's because I value education, <laughs> you know, or I value um, job security. There's a value that underlies that. And here's some examples. If I value self-sufficiency, then I might have the goal of maintaining my employment by doing a good job, by meeting or exceeding job expectations. I might have a different reason for having this goal, but it, it's someone who values self-sufficiency. And someone who values self-sufficiency might have a different goal. But these two are related. If, if a person wants to do a good job because they don't want to lose that job, then that value is, is related to self-sufficiency. If I value personal integrity, then one of the goals that could come out of that is paying all my bills on time. If I value health, and you know, veering off into other non-financial values, um, or not directly financial, if I value health, I might have different goals. I could um, have a goal of exercising so many times a week. I could have a goal of getting health insurance. Um, so from a particular value, different goals can come. But our goals are always rooted in our values, whether we think about it or not. And that's all important underlying stuff to be aware of as we think about how we're teaching our kids about money. And if our kids, um, if, if, if a child, and this happens in grade school, if a child 
or middle school or other ages too. If a child comes and says, I want to give some money to the hungry people in wherever, um, or I want to I want to help from Hurricane Sandy. Um, we can help reinforce the value in, in the form of the conversation we have. We say, wow, you really care about helping other people, or you really care, or you, you really like to share so that people have their needs met. In some way, the way you, you have a conversation will reinforce a value that's in a formative stage. Because another thing, <laughs> it's possible that they might want to be giving, bringing things for Hurricane Sandy or bringing money for Hurricane Sandy because all their friends are. <laughs> and that might be the main reason. Um, and you could reinforce that by saying, you know, by saying why? Well, everybody's doing it. Oh, well, we need you to fit in. And then you would be reinforcing this other value. So the way you have a conversation about it can influence the formation of the values that will stay with them and influence everything they ever want to do with their money throughout their lives. So, values do influence what we spend our money on. Once in a while, and this, these are just the same bullets we had already, but once in a while, we may look at how we're spending money and saying, wow, is that a reflection of my values? Do I really, I think I probably told the story about the woman who spent $840 a year on Mountain Dew and didn't realize that she was spending that much. Is Mountain Dew really that important to me compared to all the other things I could do with $840? So sometimes we're doing the fritter thing, like you mentioned, and we are not aligning our spending with our values. But if we're aware of it, then we'll, we will almost certainly realign our spending because we want our spending to match our values. Another big concept that people often put on their little worksheet is um, the difference between needs and wants. And needs are basic for living, food, a place to live, clothing. But there's, you know, gradations there. There's food and there's food. <laughs> you know, there's the bare minimum rice and beans to, to live on, to, to stay alive. And then there's, you know, steak and lobster, those kinds of things. So it can be, and there's clothing and there's clothing, there's shelter and there's shelter. Um, What's the definition between needs and wants? That can be pretty tricky in my view. Um, wants are things that make our life comfortable, enjoyable, anything that's extra beyond bare minimum. And with younger children, it's really appropriate to talk about needs and wants in black and white terms. But as kids get older, they're going to have to see sometime that needs and wants are shades of gray, <laughs> that it's not just black and white. Yes, all I really need for food is rice and beans or some very minimal food. Um, and so, yes, some of these other things are wants, um, but they're more important wants. And, and so the way I think about needs, I don't teach adults a lot about needs and wants, make your distinction. I teach about a continuum of priorities and shades of gray and deciding what's more important than something else. And you're gonna need that language to talk with kids about money at some point. They're different for everyone. They change over time. Different for everyone because, you know, there was a time when I didn't need glasses. <laughs> um, not everybody needs glasses. Some people need childcare, other people don't. Um, a variety of reasons why our needs might be different, even from an absolute black and white perspective. They are going to change over time, and they are going to change with our family circumstances. But more, most importantly about needs and wants, I, I think we need to recognize uh, uh, at some point, as our kids are mature enough to deal with somewhat abstract concepts, we need to recognize that it's not a black and white question. It's, well, I think it's a need. And there's social needs. All the kids are wearing this kind of clothes right now. Well, that may not be a need from a physical perspective, but there may be a need element to it in terms of your child's social comfort or self-esteem, depending on the whole context of the child's situation. So it's, it's often a judgment call, what's really a need and what's really a want. Okay, and so here, I forgot I had this slide in here, even despite my notes. So, so we do think about these things, and I may have used these same slides at my um, first presentation. If we're spending our money wisely, all of 
our spending would be on the things that are at the far high priority end of our continuum. And if we get more money, if we get a raise, then we would be spending our money, the extra money, on the next most important things and not spending it on the stuff that's out here. And if we're spending our money this way, um, then that means we haven't thought it over because we are spending some money here on something that's not very important while there's things here and here that we aren't spending money on and yet those are more important. We have put them in our mind at a higher priority and that's where we have the Mountain Dew money, the, the fritter money that we aren't thinking about. So this is a piece of the perspective that ideally we'd want our kids to learn is to, to learn to just decide which is more important and think about their spending that way. So it comes down to priorities and that's a lot of what we need to be aware of when we're teaching kids about money. Now, this is a famous quote. Do not worry about that your children never listen to you. Instead, worry that they are always watching you. I'd like you to take a minute, you can turn your worksheet over if you want, and think about the ways in which, and, and think about the children in your lives, including the children, maybe the, your adult children, but thinking back to when they were children. Um, how did you set a financial example? And or how could you? And I'm gonna give you a minute, and then I'm gonna ask some questions, despite the fact that you're a tiny group and he's recording. I know that this group is mighty. I would encourage you also to think simple. Little things can be valuable examples. What ideas have come to your mind? You don't have to bear anything that you don't want the world to know. <laughs> well, what I do is retirement. I started that when I was 20 years old. Um, pensioning needs versus wants. Um, since my, my health changed, I don't, I share way more. My donation giving for last year was way higher than other years. Cool. I came out in taxes. Mm -hmm. uh, I invest in fruits and vegetables and, and exercise for a healthy year. Okay. And that's a, a, a wonderful example. And do you, I don't eat out because I have to have a very low sodium diet. So okay. I really watch my salt and don't eat out because it's just you can't control it. So you, you don't eat out for health reasons, but it has its financial ramifications as well. I'm, I'm curious, the first things you mentioned were saving for retirement. And I, wanna, I should give Betsy a chance too. Do your kids see that? Or did they see that? Did yeah. they know? Yes. Because Certain things that you do are no good as an example if nobody knows you're doing them. If they happen in the quiet and the kids don't ever know. So in order for something to be an example, they have to be aware that it's happening. So that's cool that you were saving for retirement and your kids knew that. That's great. Betsy, did you have any other thoughts besides the kinds of things Julie mentioned? You know, probably not a whole lot different from some of the things that you've already talked about, Barb. Um, so I won't go into those, but you know, not always having to purchase the brand name or the most expensive just because it has a certain name on it, or mm -hmm. you know, buying a house within a certain price range because the realtor says you can afford it. Ha. You don't want to spend that much. <laughs> Wonderful examples. Yeah, um, I also think there's 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 a lot more out there too. And and when you're having young children you know, you may tell them you're saving for retirement and they'll hear that word save, but they won't get it. But little over time, that will have a cumulative value if they know that that's happening. But with young ch younger children, you can start having an impact early on with um, some simple things. If you shop with a list, <laughs> that's an example. If you, um, my mom used to, I don't do this, but my mom kept a list on the fridge, you know, on, with a magnet and a note, note of paper so that she would always know what she was out of because we lived five miles from a grocery store and she didn't want to be running to the grocery store just because, oh crud, I forgot I was out of brown sugar, you know? Things like that, that planning, that, that ability to plan. Um, if you 
unit price. If you look at, at prices and say, well, look at this, this is the big box, this is the small box, and the big box costs more, but look how many ounces it's got in it. And I'm doing the math in my head, and I can see that, that it's a better buy, even though it's a bigger price tag. Little kids can understand that. Not tiny kids, but even five, six, seven-year-olds, they may not know the math exactly, but they can get that. Um, so some of those simple things that we take for granted, making sure our kids see that we're doing that stuff is valuable because, as I said, the example isn't as powerful. Sooner or later they may figure it out, but it's not as powerful if they don't know what's going on. So thinking out loud about why you're deciding certain things instead of just going through the grocery store or the whatever store, um, but instead saying, oh, let's see, now here's this, but here's this, hmm, which one should I get? You know, I'm looking at this shirt or this shirt, and well, I like this, but I like this. And, and doing that kind of think out loud stuff instead of just standing there and thinking it over and saying, okay, I'm gonna get this one. Because how will your kids know how you decided? Make your example visible is one of the key things that you can do. I also like to point out the power of language. Um, and I think I probably used this in my first session with you guys too. Um, but we say this thing a lot. We say, I can't afford it. Um, do you? I'm assuming you do. Yeah. Um, and, and that's okay. I mean, to, to say no in front of kids, to say no so that they know that there's limits, that's a good thing. Instead of always saying yes to kids, that's not a good thing. But when we say we can't afford it, we're usually lying. And our kids will know that. If I'm looking at some $5 a pound meat in the meat counter and I say, oh, I can't afford that this week. Well, that's not true. I could buy that meat. <laughs> or if I'm looking at a $40 sweater, my kids would know that I could get this $40 sweater. They know I'm lying. And so then they, they wonder, and if, if I say then to them something they want, no, I can't afford that this week, they would know that I'm lying because they would see that I have spent money on other things this week. So we, we need to tell the truth. And the truth is that we choose not to afford it. And, and how we talk to our kids then is say, you know what? I could buy that $5 box of cereal, but I have other more important things that I want to spend my money on. Or I could buy this sweater, but I'm not going to because I have done these other things this week and so the money, the money I don't want to borrow from next week. So the, the kind of language we use and by, by letting kids see our choices, I choose not to afford it. Um, those, that's really powerful in terms of helping kids not see that mom is just, or dad, but in this case, we're talking about mom. <laughs> um, not just see that mom is an arbitrary ruler, but in fact that mom's making decisions and thinking things over. Even when it comes to big decisions, even it's like, should we move or shouldn't we move? Or should we get a new computer? Or do we stick with the old one for another year? Um, those kind of big decisions, when kids are a certain age, it's useful to involve them too. But by putting things into words and then helping them see that we're not making an arbitrary decision, nope, we're not getting a new computer. Instead, for them to say, hey, well, your dad and I talked about that and um, we thought about this and this and this, and for those reasons, we decided. So let them to see the deciding process and not just have it be an invisible thing that happens in your mind. Um, and for couples, it, it, for couples who are parenting or um, together, then that's a little easier. For single parents, I think that's a little harder because they aren't necessarily talking with someone else about the decisions. So they have to be a little more intentional about explaining some of the rationales behind decisions rather than just having it appear to be an arbitrary thing. A lot of times people wonder, oh, when do I start teaching kids about money? Or they don't think about teaching kids about money until they're 16. Or, you know, I've got my first, the kid, oh my gosh, the kid's earning money and look what they're doing with it. Um, every age provides learning opportunities. And I didn't want to give these to you guys before because I wanted you to think about your own ideas when you started working on that worksheet. But, but this is a, just a, 
starter sheet. That's all it is, is a starter sheet. And it focuses especially on younger ages because younger ages are when we're not sure what to do. How can my three-year-old, what can I teach my three-year-old about money? Well, your three-year-old's not gonna get retirement funding, <laughs> but they are gonna get some, some things. They're gonna see that you're using money and they're also gonna see that you're using paper or plastic, you know, checks or um, plastic. Um, and they can then, even at three or four, they can see when the bill comes that, you pay, that you're paying the bill. They learn to keep money safe, you know, um, and they learn that money and things go back and forth. Um, so even at, at various ages, there are different skills you can teach kids, and it's valuable to start early. Um, and as we pointed out with the example, at every age, they are learning, whether we're teaching or not, <laughs> they're learning. So whether it's intentional or unintentional, we will be teaching them. Um, the most important thing, when you want to learn anything, if any skill you want to learn, the most important thing is to have practice. Kids need practice using money. How can we give our kids practice using money? Depending on the age, let them pick out the cereal in the grocery store based on the amount of money that you have set aside for that purpose. Let them, you know, give them so much money. They can pick out the cereal. They could pick which flavor of X, Y, or Z, you know, which flavor of pudding, <laughs> um, which flavor of jello. Um, they, yes, they can make little choices in the grocery store. Yeah. Uh, my granddaughter likes to have garage sales. So she'll go through her, her stuff and decide, okay, what can I sell in a garage sale? And she'll actually label it and then she'll actually sell it at the garage sale. Cool. Her parents. Her, so her parents are having a garage sale, but she's putting her stuff in and it's sort of independent choices of what she's ready to get rid of and, and what price and to put on it price. oh that's wonderful experience as a great learning activity and it's practice it's practicing entrepreneurial skills as well um, as well as practicing choices um, counting money is in the eggs coins and dollars and yep practice money. counting money and and yeah if you have money inside the little plastic eggs that creates a wonderful opportunity and kids learn a lot of that nowadays in school as well. But it's valuable for them to have that learning reinforced at home um, so that they see that it's not just this academic thing we do at school, but it's really something that we can pay attention to. The, not the only, but probably the biggest way that kids can get significant practice on an ongoing basis with using money is by having an allowance. Allowances are somewhat controversial. Um, how to handle allowances is somewhat controversial. Um, experts are in favor of, from, a standpoint, from the standpoint of teaching financial management skills, experts focus on the, the importance of having predictable income. So, and that plays into what's controversial about allowances. The, the controversial element about allowances is, should it be payment for things done, or should it just be money that you get? Um, and every family has to make their own decision there. Um, but the, there's a strong argument to be made in favor of it being money that you get for your use simply because you're a member of the family, as opposed to being money that you get because you made your bed and because you did the dishes and because you, you know, cleaned the bathroom or whatever it is were your chores. Um, and, and people have trouble with that. Um, and, and again, it's a decision for people to make. But if your allowance is set at a certain level but it's gonna be reduced, if you didn't do this or didn't do this, or if it's gonna be reduced if you swore or if you misbehave or, or, or whatever, then the kids never learn to manage money because they, they never get their allowance. They can't learn to plan ahead. And so providing 
an element of predictable income is an important thing to think about as you think about how to handle allowances with your children and whether to do allowances with your children. A common compromise um, and probably a really effective compromise for people who really feel strongly that kids need to learn to earn money they don't, need, they don't need to think that money is just a given, that they just get it regardless of what they do. Um, a common element is to have a, a base allowance that they get regardless. And mind you, that's not to say there shouldn't be consequences if they don't do their chores or if they misbehave, but those consequences don't have to be financial. I should do my chores just because I'm a member of the family and it's part of my contributing to the, to the family well-being. Um, and if I don't do my chores, I, I might experience some consequences, but that doesn't need to be a, a financial consequence. So the compromise then would be we've got, sure, we've got base chores, that's up to the family, but we've also got base allowance that the kids can count on, that they can plan on. But then they have opportunities to earn extra money. Um, for doing bigger things. Oh, it's spring, there's all this yard, yard work to do. And, you know, there's, there, are, there are families that put up, put up a job list every Friday night saying, these are the jobs that are available and whoever wants to do them, you know, you, you say, I want to do this job and then you'll get, you'll get paid for that job. It's like learning to bid for a, 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 a construction contract or something. But as you're thinking about allowances with the children you care about, Think about the importance of a predictable income so they can learn to plan ahead because without that they miss a lot of skill building opportunity. How much it should be depends on what, what it's supposed to cover. Um, what, well, typical allowances are, are enough for kids to have just spending money, that kind of thing. Um, but I know that in some families, as kids get older, they are given enough money to buy all their clothes, and they are put in charge of all their clothes and all sorts of other important things. And then those kids have large sums of money that they're managing. Now, it would never be smart to give a 13-year-old a large sum of money monthly or, or seasonally to manage unless you had worked them up to that. You, know, you have to work them in with a small allowance to make sure that they have built those skills before you give them their whole clothing allowance because they may not have the skills to, to get the clothing figured out otherwise. But the amount of your allowance really does depend on what, what expenses the kids are supposed to cover. Um, I don't know if I should put this on tape. I often tell my own story about allowances. Um, uh, my kids were, um, just turning, one was just turning four and the other was almost seven at the time we got divorced. And I specifically remember thinking, when it's his birthday, I'll have to give them money so they can give him a present. And then, worse, when it's my birthday, he'll give them money so they can buy me a present. And that even, is that even right? Because he's paying child support, you know? So I started. At that point, I started with allowances. And the point of the allowance, the, the, the amount they got was supposed to be enough for a, a little bit of spending money, enough for gifts, enough for, um, some, some of it was delegated to saving, and there was a rules about this, and some of it was for um, sharing, a church offering, and also for, th I, I encouraged them to plan ahead. So we had five envelopes. They had a, they had a saving envelope. They had a, a church envelope, and that would get emptied periodically, you know, on every Sunday or whatever. They had a, a spending purse, but they would have a plan envelope if they wanted to be saving money for something bigger, and they had a gift envelope. And so it was very clear, this is what these, this is supposed to cover. And, and I gave them a structure to help them accomplish those goals. Now, depending on what you're doing, you may not have a lot of different things, but it's very smart if you want your kids to learn to save or you want your kids to learn to share in one way or another. It's very smart to um, include those as part of what their allowance is for because then they'll have practice with saving. They'll have practice with sharing. Um, 
It's also really important that we be ready to let them live with the consequences of their choices. Uh, and, and again, I have a personal story. And if, if you were teaching this about money, you would have your own stories. Um, I, Emily, the younger one, she was only five, and four was very young to start her with an allowance. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, <laughs> it. It was what we did, and it, it worked, but it was, it was very young. But sometime when she was about five, maybe six, um, we had a standard practice that if there was something they wanted to spend their money on, and they hadn't brought their money with, but we knew they had the money, that's okay. I'll pay for it and they pay me back when we get home. That was standard, so they didn't have to be carrying their money everywhere. Um, so we were in a store and there was a toy she wanted. And it was a cheap, junky toy. You know, four or five dollars. Um, and I tried pretty hard to point out all its drawbacks. And I tried pretty hard to say, oh, are you really sure? Or should you think about it and come back? And she was positive. And she had the money. And at, it, it took me a while, but, but after some time of discussion, not really argument, but discussion, I backed off. I said, okay, go for it. And in my head, I said, you'll be sorry. <laughs> and you know what? She wasn't sorry. She was right, and I was wrong. She, now, mind you, there were other times when they regretted their spending choices. But that, I tell that story because it's an example of, you know, it is their money. And maybe they're the ones who know best. <laughs> and in this case, she, she got way more than $5 worth of pleasure out of that junky little toy. So we need to let them make their choices, even when they're pretty young. But that's why we give them the practice opportunities so that we can prevent them from making catastrophic bad decisions. Kids who've never had practice managing money get off into, um, you know, either when they're 16 or 17 and have a high school job or they get off into the real world and they can make catastrophic choices because they haven't learned. They can just spend a whole chunk of money on something and not realize that they have to also meet all these other things because they haven't had practice. They haven't learned that. They may know it in their head, but they haven't learned it in their being. You know, it hasn't become integrated into part of them. So. Yeah, and the last bullet says provide helpful structure or tools. Depending on their age and their skills, um, some, we had one parent tell us here about giving her child uh, a prepaid card to take on a trip, a school trip to Washington, D.C., I think it was. Um, but she wanted the child to have the money she needed. She didn't want her carrying cash. Um, she wanted her to have a limit so that she could not overspend because the child had asked for a, a debit card on her bank account. <laughs> and, and mom was wise and said she could really spend a lot if she had a debit card on her bank account. So mom provided this prepaid card that only had so much money on it. Child did not know that mom could replenish the card if something big, whether opportunity or crisis, arose. But it was a tool that let that child know that there was a limit. So parents can think about what's going to be the tool that suits the situation. Um, and at some point, kids can learn to manage bank accounts, and they can learn to manage um, various kinds of plastic. But we need to make sure we help them figure out how to do that. So, and, and in my case, the story I told you it was envelopes. And we had envelopes in our house for years and years and years. And, and one time an envelope got lost that had $140 in it. And thank God it was found later. <laughs> but um, it was, it was, that was, oh boy, that was going to be a big lesson. And it was a big lesson. That child was horrified. And it was two weeks at least that it was missing. And then it was found. Um, so perhaps I didn't provide all the helpful structure, but she did learn the lesson. And it would have been, it was not her save envelope, because I always kept those. It was her plan ahead envelope and it was lost for a while. The key concept that, the, one key concept that kids need to know, and, and a key concept that they learned through allowances, um, is the concept of scarcity. That, that idea that you can't have everything you want, there are limits. Even Bill Gates has certain things he can't have, and in his case, they're 
big things like world peace. But um, kids need experience planning ahead. They need to have success saying, wow, I remembered that Christmas was coming and I set aside money and then I could go and get gifts for mom and dad. I knew that prom was coming and that I was going to want whatever. Uh, they need success in planning ahead. If they have failure in planning ahead, that's okay too. I mean, they didn't succeed and so they didn't get to do what they would have hoped for. I have a great story that someone told me about um, a child who ha was a 15-ish year old child who had had her whole clothing allowance. So she had substantial amounts of money to work with and she had an opportunity to go, to go with a friend over Christmas break to Florida, but she was gonna need to buy her own plane ticket. And that child went without clothing, got by with all her old clothing for the whole fall season in order to have the plane ticket money. And if mom and dad had said, well, we'll pay for the plane ticket, but you can't have any new clothes, the kid would have rebelled like crazy. But because she was in control and she was making her choice and she planned ahead and she went to Florida, that was a wonderful, successful experience for her. They need experience regretting an expenditure. We don't want to stop our children from making every dumb choice, which is why with the junky toy, I decided, okay, I'll back off and let her buy the junky toy because they need that experience with regret. We don't like our kids to have bad experiences, but they need them. They need to learn to use the full range of resources too. They need to learn that some things you can do by making them or a combination of things um, so that we don't have to spend as much money because we're using our skills or our time or our energy or uh, materials we have at home as well as spending some money. So they need experience using being resourceful, thinking about all the resources that are available. They also need to experience the benefit of having money saved up just in case. The idea that you can't plan ahead for everything and that if I've got some money that I'm setting back just in case something happens, um, either a need or an opportunity. Um, oh man, all my friends are going to the movie tomorrow night. Well, if I didn't know that was gonna happen and I don't have money for it, then I can't go. But if I had set aside money, and this is a different kind of emergency savings, but for a teenager, we could call that an emergency, then they would have the money um, that they could do that and they would experience the benefit of having some money set back just in case. A little bit about credit. Um, we need to remember that 18 year olds and college students are prime targets for credit card marketing. Um, and one thing has changed just in the last few years, because it changed between my older and my younger child. Um, the, the Credit Card Act made it so that no 18 year old can get a, a credit card on, in their own name unless they can show that they're financially independent. In other words, if they're a student, they're probably not paying their whole own way. But if they're working full time supporting themselves, then an 18 year old should be able to get a, a credit card, although they might have to do something to prove it. But generally, an 18 year old's gonna need a cosigner. And not till you're 21 can you get a card just in your own name. And what that does, it creates a point of risk for parents who cosign. Because if the kid screws up, then the parent's name is on that card too, or whoever the cosigner is. But it creates this opportunity for supervised practice so that the child's first experience out in the world with borrowing has someone looking over their shoulder to guide them. And that's really valuable. Um, and that's a, a terrific thing that the CARD Act did because a lot of young adults used to make terrible choices and they still could if nobody's supervising them. But if the cosigner is supervising, then, then they should be aware. Because kids make this crazy mistake. They, they say, um, they, they get their bill and they say, oh yeah, I see, I spent $200 this last month and I need to, I need to send a payment of, of $15 by the 10th of the month. And they do that and they think they're doing everything right. They need someone to help them be aware of how much that's gonna cost them and the kind of pit that they will be digging for themselves. It's also pretty critical 
to encourage our kids to get credit and use it during those prime target years. Um, and that is hard because a lot of parents uh, want, to, want to tell their kids, don't even think, don't even go there. And, and you, you know your kid, you may have certain kids where you really do want to tell them don't go there. But I was just with a group of kids last, not kids, young adults last night, one of whom couldn't get credit now. She wasn't a student now and she never had had any credit, and now she was at a loss as to how to get credit. And, and we talked about some options. I mean, there, there are a couple options available to her, but this is a prime opportunity where they can build a credit history. And if we can encourage them to take advantage of that opportunity, but just make sure that they know that they it's an opportunity that comes once, and if you screw it up, it will haunt you for a long time. So building a positive credit history is critical to a lot of things you might want to do in the future. So those are some key things we want to keep in mind about credit. And now, it's time for you to think about what you might want to do, what steps you might want to take in relation to the kids you care about and making sure they learn about money and build financial skills over time. And sometimes when parents leave this, the first thing they want to do is to uh, boost their own skills or their own habits, improve their own habits, start balancing their checkbook, for example, um, those kinds of things, so that they can feel like they have integrity in teaching their kids. So sometimes that's part of it, too. But there are steps we can all take. And I have a couple other handouts optional if you want them. One is a, a, a little longer thing that deals with talking with kids about money. And it has information about different age groups, uh, young children, middle, middle aged children, and then teenagers. And then this, um, this sheet is a list of websites. And it says websites for kids. Actually, some of the websites are more for parents than for kids, but they're about dealing with kids. And some of them are for kids. So those are resources that are available. And if you have any questions, and Julie needs to leave. She needed to leave five minutes ago. I was watching. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You were, you were, um, you, you were um, good sports. <laughs> Very good sports. <laughs>